Welcome back. This is Conversations in Artificial Intelligence. This is Paolo Yorost. And today we're going to talk for the first time about how the design of interfaces, not necessarily only software interfaces, but more broadly user interfaces, is going to affect the way that we consume artificial intelligence. And so with me today, it is uh, an honor and privilege to have Sam Gong, who is the principal designer for artificial intelligence at uh, Intralinks. How are you, Sam? I'm doing great. Thank you, Paolo. So, uh, Sam, very nice having you here. And, uh, you know, we haven't in this uh, uh, series of conversation yet looked into really a very, very important aspect here of how uh, ultimately users consume artificial intelligence, which is uh, design. How did you end up in artificial intelligence? How a designer, an artist ended up looking into artificial intelligence? A lot of people say, you know, it's, it's either the artificial intelligence finds you or you find artificial intelligence. Um, in this case, artificial intelligence found me. The company that I'm working for was, you know, this is my dream company. And uh, when they contacted me about this opportunity to look at artificial intelligence on a big fintech industry, you know, I jumped at the opportunity. Tell us a little bit about what it is that you do at Intralinks today. As you already know, I am a principal product designer for the Artificial Intelligence Center of Excellence here at Intralinks. And so as part of the Center of Excellence, what we do is um, we create user-centered design deliverables, but also processes for product integration with uh, any product or any capability that we have here at Interlinks. Well, what do you consider is special or particular or unique or something that, you know, people should consider when we look at the marriage between design and artificial intelligence? When it comes to artificial intelligence, it is clearly a, I would call it a, a disrupting capability in the design world. That means that in its current state, there's not much methodology and there's very little guidance on how to approach design for AI. So at this stage right now, um, what designers are trying to do is to come up with a method of approaching new product introduction. Why don't we pick up a couple of examples uh, where traditional design approaches do not work in AI? Maybe one example. I would say that one of the biggest challenges that, um, that we have to have, uh, that we have to consider for design and AI is that AI, unlike traditional design, where once you've designed something, you've created a framework, you don't really have to change much. For example, a, um, a website will always look like the website, the pages, the product pages of a, say, Amazon or of whatever favorite retail site you have. They'll always essentially look the same. Now, when it comes to AI, the consideration is that things change, right? There is uh, training that's involved uh, with, uh, with the algorithms. And with that training, humans are, or the users, are an integral part of that. So they will actually have to touch the interface and play with that um, in order to train the system. Now, that might be there today, but as the system evolves, it might not need to be there tomorrow. What type of challenges that situation poses to, to the design? It becomes a check for an enterprise, right? So in order to be able to pivot, in order to be able to adapt like this, your fundamental design processes will need to be much more um, rigorous than you've had before. That means that there's very little room or there's less room for error along the way because what you don't want to have happen is change the interface from um, one evolution to another. You need to ensure that in your design, you can modularly evolve your design as needed, but it still reads the same to the user. And in order to achieve that, you have to think much more modularly than you, you had before. What type of inputs do you need to have that you didn't need to have before? And what type of other professionals inside the organization you have to interact for achieving a good results in AI? So you need to be uh, much more uh, rigorous with having a better uh, component library than you did before. And you, your approach to the design needs to be much more I hesitate to use the word because there's, this is actual, this is an industry term, but it's, um, you need to be much more atomic in your design. 
meaning you have to think of pieces like Lego pieces that you can put together and take apart, but it still holds together. For example, uh, very scalable websites that you can think of today, such as Amazon, they do a very great job at thinking modularly. So you'll see pieces that they can add in for um, any one of their product pages that is relevant to that product. So things such as upsells, cross-sells, these are all presented as carousels on the bottom of a page. And that's thinking modularly because I can now remove that but the page still feels the same to you. So I'd like to dig in now into some of the things that make machine learning a little bit different than other technologies, at least mm-hmm. from my viewpoint of product development. And, and the problem is that because it's different, it also impacts the end user. So one of the things that is different is that processes that are related to machine learning are never 100% consistent. So meaning, Sometimes the, the intelligence makes an error. So can you help us understand this area a little bit better and what are the design principles that are followed to deal with this? As for the first principle, one of the fundamental pieces that I think that designers need to understand that they currently don't understand is how classical machine learning, how it works, how to train for it, and how to design for it, right? And so I call this instrumenting the AI interface. So at a basic level, designers need to understand that machine learning iterates through a training matrix of, and your users might already know this, but you would need to consider on one axis, the positive or negative. So in the example of a retail website, we could think that the AI is what's going to suggest relevant uh, upsells for the user. Now, positive or negative would be whether or not the system decides to show that to you. And then the, on the other axis of this matrix, you have the true or false. So this is whether or not the user actually wanted the item. When we as designers need to design, we need to be much, uh, we need to be very deliberate about where those feedback points are for um, you know, true negative, um, true positive, false negative, false positive. We need to be very deliberate about where they need to be measured in the experience. One consideration is um, we have to be much more disciplined in identifying the flows. So having a flow inventory helps. So think about, um, for the example of um, the suggested upsells, Identifying, for example, that a true positive, this means that an item gets recommended in a carousel and the user selects it. We need to measure that and we need to account for that. So deliberately saying that this is, you know, this is the behavior that we're looking for. Then we have to say, okay, so on what pages would this be on the product list page on an add to basket? Um, So where in the user's interaction do we know, can we validate that um, this is a true positive? And again, for true negative, This is something that an item that is recommended in the carousel, but the user does not add it to the cart. Now, this might seem like a failure, but actually this is very helpful for data scientists to be able to train and understand the accuracy or the precision of the algorithm. So this is something not really to be avoided from a design point of view. You're not trying to make something that only gives you true positives. So false positive is where an item gets recommended in a carousel and the user does not select it. Um, A true negative is when an item is not recommended in carousel and the user doesn't add it to the cart. And finally, um, a false negative. This is something that's very interesting too, because this is a false negative was never recommended in the carousel to begin with. So how would you be able to understand what is a false negative in the experience? So you would then have to understand what is the set of, of the entire product line and what was not recommended by understanding what was recommended and looking at from there, what was the pieces that is not in that carousel. And then what, are, what would the experience be um, in order to, for us to understand or to categorize that. So that would be something that the user possibly searches for in a targeted search and then adds it to the carousel, but it was never in the carousel to begin with. From an example, those are the points that a designer needs to be very deliberate in their design and identifying where those feedback points are for AI. From a design point of view, the first piece of data that we would need to get is understanding and empathizing with the user and understanding also the context that the user is in. 
let's talk about, you know, again, a, a retail e-commerce website. So is there a harm in false positives, right? So a false positive, as I said before, is something that is the user does not need, but you recommended it. Well, it depends, right? So if it's something that if you're creating a experience, a shopping experience where time is of essence, introducing false positives increases the distrust of the system and it wastes the user's time. But if it's something that's just a casual, you know, just a casual shopping experience, like browsing through the mall and just looking for what you want, false positives are not necessarily bad. They might present the experience, in fact, of a much more plentiful selection. So what are the design principles that are utilized to take care of this transition? Like, I need more user interaction in, in the beginning of the lifetime of a system that is intelligent, and then the user interaction is going to evolve over time. What is the alchemy, if you like, that allows you to design something that will last over time? The critical piece here is understanding what the user's problem is from the beginning. And one piece of this is it's very important to understand in the design is there is a very big possibility that you're asking the wrong um, or you're trying to solve a problem that's really not the user's problem. Um, this is where creativity is very important. And this is where principles such as design thinking is very important. In an example, um, you know, we can think about the reCAPTCHA website of, um, you know, that, that you see to verify that you're not a robot. Now, in being able to look at, um, you know, for reCAPTCHA, let's say, for example, um, it'll ask you, what are the frames where there's a stoplight? This is, you know, asking where there's a stoplight and training and creating a validation set. This is, you know, for the sake of, let's say, a Tesla out there that would actually need this classification information or this, uh, the extraction information to be able to understand that this is a stoplight that you're looking at and not a picture of a stop. I mean, not a drawing of a stoplight, the actual stoplight. That's something that you cannot ask the um, Tesla or a driver of a, of, a, of a smart car to do while they're driving. In that case, the design itself would say, they would say, look, we're not going to design while the user is in the context of driving. What is another way that we can do this and create this information? Well, what are the additional values? Who, would, who can we use and who can we utilize in order to solve this problem? We all know that humans are better at looking at pictures and extracting than currently a lot of AIs are. So why can't we use it to solve and verify that you're human and not a robot? So let's do that for an e-commerce website to validate your payment so that it instills the trust in you as a purchaser of, um, you know, of some kind of a site that this website or this e-commerce site is taking the precautions necessary in order to ensure that there's no fraud. That's the most critical piece that design solves is it validates whether or not that the problem in the first place is a problem of that specific user. And if not, where can we creatively apply that um, in order to, to uh, make it solve the right problem? Is there out there an example of great AI design in, in the world, in the systems that you have seen and you want to talk like you and comment? This might be kind of interesting, but um, the best AI I've ever seen um, that handles the experience correctly is not necessarily in any AI I've seen immediately by itself. Um, the recapture experience is, you know, that's a, that's a really good one. Uh, just I've seen it because they've asked the right problems. But the, the ideal situation, I think, when, when we're talking about deep learning or beyond deep learning, even common sense learning, the best types of interactions or designs I've ever seen was actually in video games. Video games, um, from what I've seen, there's a few great video games out there. Um, one of them is, the name escapes me right now, but one of them you're in a, you know, you're in a giant robotic vehicle where you pilot and you shoot um, other robots. But um, what was interesting about this experience was that the designers of this video game considered that the users can choose a different voice for the AI of the system. And the reason they thought about this was, and they gave great intentionality to this, they thought that if the voice was a comforting voice, it would help the person relate to the device or the machine in a much more personal way, and they would want to protect it. But then in another mode, you can, um, you can have the voice be like an Arnold Schwarzenegger in Terminator, and when you need to just go all out, it would just change its voice, 
and it would put you in this mood or in this mode of not connecting with anything and just just to shoot them up style and try to shoot anything out there. But it's interesting because when you're talking about voice and tone of the AI system, when you design it correctly, you should be able to get better results as you predefine it with the user. That it's an example where the AI is choosing the tone and the uh, piece of, of the speech, basically. So to give some kind of motivation to the user. Correct. The user then relates to the AI as a specific person. You know, we have to think about voice and tone because you can think about what effects you would get. Voice, by the way, would be who is speaking. So say, for example, if you had a butler like Anthony Hopkins, in, um, if he were to suggest something to you, that would give you a concierge experience, um, especially if you're a much more intelligent person that expects service. He would suggest things to you. Now, imagine if the voice was, Arnold Schwarzenegger telling you to get in the chopper. That's a very different experience. Tone is interesting too, because now you can have an interplay of how would he provide more urgency in his tone? How would he shout at you? How would he ask you questions? How would he console you? Now, what if it were somebody else? What if it were the Terminator? How would he console you? And what is the effect when he says, you know, you know, whoopsie, it's, it's interesting. You know, you see these movies like Terminator 2 and you see, you know, you get these great reactions and these interplays between playing with tone and voices. Very often I ask people the question, what is different today with respect to five years ago? What do you have seen that has changed in the design specifically to respond to this technology evolution? And what do you anticipate it's going to change when we're going to have uh, we're going to move from narrow intelligence to a uh, broader artificial intelligence. I think the biggest changes that you're going to see is much more deliberate control of voice and tone in order to mitigate that your a user's reaction to failure. Um, it's interesting. We're much more forgiving of failures when it comes to um, things that we think are not as accountable or we don't attribute accountability to. For example, if somebody my age comes to me and accidentally spills a drink on me, I'm going to be very upset. But if the voice and tone is someone like, you know, my grandmother or someone and they spill a drink on you and they come at you with that tone, you don't necessarily see it as failure. So bring this back to AI. I think what you'll see is a much more conscious effort to represent a, a very deliberate voice and tone and a person behind it in order to help you or help the user be a part of training the system. Where do you think design is going and what type of challenges are happening? Is the voice and tonality the most important thing in that area or are there additional design considerations that will result in better user experiences, if you like? I think some of the other pieces that you're going to see is um, the context or awareness of the context around the user. It's almost less about the user and more about understanding how the user feels in relation to where they are at the moment. So for example, if I were to create a scheduling app, a smart scheduling app that uh, works with you to schedule you know, your next appointment, it's a very different experience if you, know, you were doing this in your living room and you're just, you know, you're calm and you're relaxed on your couch and you're scheduling some, you know, maybe some appointment versus if I were in line at my dentist's office and there's 10 people behind me you know, and they're all rushing and I've got to go to back to work. I don't want a slow experience, but I feel as if a very successful AI would adapt to where I am and understand what to ask, when to ask it and why they're asking it. I like to pick your mind on where we're going when we consider the future, not only mm -hmm. the voice assistance, but also the visual element of human machine interaction. There's going to be a lot more opportunities to build much more effective experiences for people. And what I mean by effective is however the designer intentionally designs the, the experience for. So let's think about the, um, an artificial representation of a human or, you know, there, there's a lot of applications for something like that. If it were something to help someone learn and understand and have conversations with people of different cultures, being able to understand what the person really means or what it would mean based on if they were in this culture or that culture. For instance, smiling might not be a good thing in one culture, whereas another culture, you know, or in one culture, it might be 
uh, it might look very devious, whereas another culture smiling might be something that's very comforting. So making people very aware of what was intended would be very important. I think also, you know, when you're speaking of trauma, it's interesting, right? I've heard of there would be um, soldiers that have difficulty coming back. They're having difficulties because, you know, they don't know. They, they might be in such a high pressure situation where showing emotion is just not a priority. How might that experience of speaking with, you know, um, speaking with a, a system or, you know, an artificial intelligence where it slowly starts introducing facial expressions and understands and, you know, and maybe exaggerates these, maybe responds to how the user's face is, you know, how the user's um, is interacting with the system. I think the possibilities are that the user can explore more with their emotional range than they could with a person. So it really depends on the context and what goals you're trying to get out of the experience. So with that said, uh, Sam, I want to thank you for being here. This has been a great interview. And uh, for anyone that is watching this, if you have comments or questions, please comment below and, and ask questions. And if you have suggestions about additional type of uh, videos or interviews like this one, please reach out to me directly. Sam, once more, thank you so much for being here. Thank you.